So thank you, Professor Penlun, for the inspiring speech. And now we're going to move on to our first keynote speaker, Professor Donald Salloway. From, um, Professor Salloway is from MIT Department of Material Science and Engineering with a research focus on the development of rechargeable battery for grid level storage and environmental sounding technology for the extraction of metals. He's the author of over 150 scientific papers and holder of 19 US patents. He's also the founder of two companies, Embry and Boston Electrometallurgical and was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Let's welcome Professor Salloway. Well, good morning. Uh, give me a second to uh, connect the computer. I get to do a little bit of uh, assembly here in front of all of you. so You can test my skills. Look at that. I guess that's why I'm a professor. Well, thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, so I was asked to talk about my experience with the liquid metal battery and also to talk about the uh, innovation process. So I'm going to try to talk on both levels. And really, the, the subtext here is cost-based discovery. And the reason I talk about cost-based discovery is that it's a little bit different from most uh, cost-based activities. Most people invent to make the coolest chemistry or the coolest idea, but when it comes to the cost, that usually is reserved for the manufacturing end of things. But it's my contention that when you're talking about energy, the competitive energies are so entrenched and the price point is so low that you have to think about cost at the very beginning. So you have to think about cost at the inventive stage. And this graph shows this is the amount of installed storage capacity on the grid as a function of capital cost. And it's a semi-logarithmic scale. So this is 1,000x, which means all of this is nothing. It's less than 0.1%. It's pretty clear all the batteries don't work. And the only thing that works is pumped hydro. The other thing that's clear is if you don't get below $500 a kilowatt hour capital cost, you're not going to have any impact. So that means you better invent something that's scalable and cheap. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. So forget all those metrics about watt hours per kilogram and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. This is the only thing that matters. But pumped hydro is geographically limited. You have to have lots of water, and you have to have a difference in elevation. So uh, I, I don't worry about other batteries. It's, uh, you're competing against diesel f fire gensets and natural gas. The lithium-ion batteries fail miserably. They're 20-year-old technology and far too expensive. And everybody who has a phone or a computer knows how the battery runs down in runtime. So what are my two ideas? First, confine your chemistry to earth abundant elements. So this is a uh, earth abundance table as a function of atomic number. I don't know. This, this was taken from a, a government publication. Uh, this audience would appreciate. Wh why would you connect? lithium to beryllium. There's no element that's got an atomic number of 3.5, so don't connect the dots. This is stupid, but somebody did it anyways. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is a logarithmic plot. So uh, what that shows you is the abundant elements are about a billion times more prevalent than the rare elements. So I forbid my students to work with anything down here. Because axiomatically, it won't scale. And you notice, tellurium is here. So I don't know why anybody works on cadmium telluride solar cells. Because even if I gave it to you for free, it doesn't exist. It's about as abundant as gold. And that's why you don't see fuel cell powered vehicles, because they have platinum catalysts. And do you think if the world demand for platinum goes up by 100 times, the price of platinum is going to fall? No, because it's a constrained element. So don't bother. You can use platinum for the jewelry market because the size of the jewelry market is small and it fits with the size of availability of the platinum market, but not for energy. It just won't work. Maybe you know, we saw we just landed on a comet. Maybe we can find some tellurium on a comet and bring it home. So if you want to make something dirt cheap, you should make it out of dirt, and preferably dirt that's locally sourced. Because it doesn't make sense to trade in our dependence for imported petroleum to dependence on imported neodymium. 
And the second thing is make it easy to manufacture. One of the reasons why lithium ion batteries are so expensive is that a modern lithium ion battery plant, you've heard about the Gigafactory. Well, the Gigafactory is gonna cost giga dollars. It costs billions of dollars to build a new lithium ion battery plant. It should cost thousands of dollars. So I started thinking about grid level storage about nine years ago. And first thing I did is ignore everything from the existing battery market because this existing battery market is designed to make batteries like this. And we're thinking about batteries for the grid. So I looked elsewhere for my inspiration. I looked at an aluminum smelter. Aluminum, this is a modern aluminum smelter. This is about uh, 20 meters. This goes back probably a kilometer or so. It was invented in 1886 by Charles Martin Hall in the US and Paul Hirule in uh, France. By the way, they were both born in the same year and they both died in the same year. And in 1886, they were both 22 years of age. So any of you who's older than 22, I want to ask, what have you invented lately? You know this. <laughs> but uh, anyways, look at bauxite, petroleum coke, 13 kilowatt hours per kilogram, uh, $5,000 a ton annual capital cost. And you go dirt to metal for less than $1 a kilogram. And you consume vast quantities of energy. So I looked at that and I said, cheap price point, scalability and huge consumption of energy. Can I teach this thing not to just consume energy, but to store it and give it back? And the answer is yes. And this is what I came up with. It's the liquid metal battery, magnesium, or some uh, electropositive metal on top, antimony, or some electronegative semi-metal on bottom, and a molten salt in between. No separator, no membrane. The magnesium is insoluble in the electrolyte. The electrolyte is insoluble in the metal. They, they self-stratify. It's self-assembling. And it generates enough heat as the current passes on charging and discharging. So when it discharges, magnesium wants to alloy with antimony. It goes down here and sends electrons through the external circuit. And on charging, you bring the magnesium back and you reconstitute you purify the components. So this is self-assembling, which means it's easy to manufacture. It's self-heating. Round-trip efficiency, and please pay attention to this, because I, I get criticized all the time for this. People say, this can't work because he's going to lose all of his energy just heating it. After paying for the electricity to heat the battery and keep it at temperature, the round-trip efficiency of our cells is about 75%, which is greater than that of pumped hydro. That's already fully amortizing the cost of energy. And doesn't care about thermal runaway. In fact, if it gets hot from excess activity, that's fine. It's done like a lithium ion battery. And by the way, you can't ship lithium ion batteries by air. You can't put a pallet of lithium ion batteries on an airplane. The lithium ion batteries come by ship and by uh, rail. But this battery, uh, when it's at room temperature, you have solid metal and solid salt. It's absolutely inert. It's absolutely safe. You can ship this all over the world, and then you heat it for the first thing. And it's designed to be cost competitive. So this was my team. Now, what's this another piece of innovation? This is David Bradwell. He had a bachelor's degree in something other than electrochemistry. I taught him electrochemistry, and I taught him not to think about the problem the way everybody else does. So as you just heard from Professor Pentland, you know, the diversity of ideas is really powerful. And I practiced this. I didn't hear Professor Pentland's talk. I just did this by sheer intuition, being, bringing people in. Um, and by the way, uh, so you have a student and you have a professor. And I'm going to tell you something. Innovation starts at the university. That's why you're here at MIT and, you know, back in the Bay Area, you've got Stanford and other schools there. The battery and electrochemistry was started by a professor at a university, Alessandro Volta. And he invented the first battery, and immediately there was the field of electrochemistry, but there was a spin-out, electroplating, electroforming, and eventually electrometallurgy. So Volta actually demonstrated a new field, and he also demonstrated for the first time the utility of a professor. Until Volta, no, nobody thought a professor could be of any use. But Volta showed that if you give a professor money and freedom to operate, 
He's liable to come up with something fresh, and he's the second product, and the second product is the student. So then the MIT Energy Initiative was formed. I had the good fortune of speaking at an event in Paris, and I was offered $4 million by Total, which then allowed me to get $7 million from ARPA-E. And with $11 million, this is what my team looked like. So now I have 20 people for three years. And 20 times 3 is greater than 3 times 20. So for three years, we had 20 people working. And they want to see diversity. She's from Spain. He's from Korea. These people were from China. Uh, she's from France, Trinidad, Tahiti, Poland. David and I were both born in Toronto in different years, of course. And, uh, <laughs> and we, had, we had a few Americans on the team as well. And, uh, so this is some of the work from the lab. I'm not going to bore you with the, the, the details. But um, we've tested over 1,000 cells of various chemistries. And a number of them are less than $100 a kilowatt hour for the combination of the electrodes and the electrolyte. But this is the piece that makes this technology really distinct. Stunningly low fade rates. So this is a cell that's operating at 600 milliamps per square centimeter, which is about 50 times the current density in a lithium ion battery, and 100% depth of discharge. So this is no game. It's not like a, a Prius where you go between 60% and 40%. This is full charge to full discharge every time. It's the highest stress test you can give. Uh, this is some earlier data. It's now gone over uh, 2,000 cycles. The fade rate is 0.002%. OK, that's just a number. What does it mean? It means that if you cycled this thing every day, full discharge, full charge, for 10 years, that's 3,650 cycles, it retains over 99% of its initial capacity. There's no battery that can go anywhere near that. You know what a lithium ion battery is worth after about four years. You might ask yourself if you can afford a Tesla. How far is it going to go in eight years' time? Silence, huh? The normal, the normal metric is 80%. This battery will drop to 80% of its nameplate capacity after 305 years. And as I look around the room, I think that would take care of pretty much everybody here in the room. So. And then uh, so several years ago, we, uh, uh, David, uh, myself, and one other person started a company. We call it a Liquid Metal Battery Corporation. It's a terrible name, but all the, all the, all the cool names were taken. Um, and then uh, two years ago, we changed the name to Ambry. Um, we found a five-letter domain name, pronounceable, that was still available. And why did, we, why did we choose Ambry? Because I invented the battery here in Cambridge. <laughs> Ambry came out of the heart of Cambridge. That's how Cisco Systems got its name. It was invented in San Francisco. So my first funding came from Bill Gates. How did I meet Bill Gates? He came to me. I didn't go to him. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. I was born in Canada. I'm too polite. So, uh, uh, so uh, how did I meet Bill Gates? He was watching my chemistry lectures online, open courseware. He watched 35 lectures of 3091. And then I got an email from a woman who said she was his secretary asking me if I'd meet him. He was coming to Boston. I ignored the email. I thought it was one of you. <laughs> so then, at some point later, she sent the email again and said, perhaps you didn't see my email. Mr. Gates would really like to meet you. I said, maybe it's real. So I said, OK. <laughs> so he came, and we sat in my office in Building 8, and we chatted for 90 minutes. We talked about distance learning, about education, online. And then we started talking about storage. And I told him about liquid metal battery. And he said, yeah, it seems to me the approach to stationary storage ought to be intrinsically different from the approach to mobile storage. I said, you're one of the few people that understands this. And he said, this is really interesting. And we had no uh, results. Our early results were terrible. Because all those 20 people, I was the only one that knew electrochemistry. <laughs> they were all bright people. But I brought them from outside the field. And I taught them how to view the problem through my eyes and then turn them loose. And they worked miracles. 
But when Bill and I first talked, it was just David and me, and the early results were terrible. But he understood the concept, and he said, if you decide to spin this out as a company, let me know. And so a year later, we approached him, and he was our first investor. So that's a really nice story to tell, because I met Bill Gates not because of my research or because of some stuff I do on the outside. I met Bill Gates because I was teaching a freshman chemistry class. And that's a really very, very nice story to be able to tell in mixed company. And then Total matched him. And uh, then uh, subsequently, we've had a Series C with Vinod Kosla from the West Coast, Karen Pritzker. You might not know, but you may have heard of Hyatt Hotels. Well, that's the Pritzker family and this firm from uh, Switzerland. And we started a manufacturing facility. We've had to invent everything. I got no help from the industry. Remember, change doesn't come from the industry. The lithium ion battery didn't come from the battery industry. It came from Sony, which wanted new batteries, and all the big battery producers refused to build lithium ion batteries because they were heavily invested in nickel metal hydride. So Sony said, we're going to do the unprecedented. We're going to build our own battery plant. And right around that time, around 1991, 92, there was this device called the cell phone was starting to take off. And the laptop computer was starting to take off. And, and so Sony wanted to put the battery into the Handycam and into the Walkman and things like that. But then the cell phone people started buying them. And then the laptop people started buying them. And the nickel metal hydride battery was decimated. But the change came from outside the industry. So when I was showing these ideas to people like GE, Siemens, all these big companies, Say, you know, help me with the power electronics, help me with the manufacturing. They look at it and say, whoa, that's pretty radical. Let's keep in touch. <laughs> so we've done it all ourselves. So this is us out in Marlborough. It's about 40 kilometers from here. This is Phil Giudice, my CEO. This is Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts. And we're cutting a ribbon here. This is a robotic manufacturing system which was invented by one of our people who used to work at Ford, not building cars, but building the robots that build the cars. So this robot takes the can, puts in the metal, puts in the salt, TIG welds the top, and for a capital cost not of a billion dollars, but for ten million dollars, you can make 130 megawatt hours a year. So this isn't the gigafactory, this is the megafactory. This is economy of scale, not by building more, but by building fewer. It just turns everything on its ear. And this shows what it would, what it would look like. These cells are about uh, four centimeters, uh, forgive me, four inches, 10 centimeters square. And this is what we have to do in manufacturing, Put, take cells and turn them into big batteries. So this aggregates into some, this is two kilowatt hours. This is about a, uh, well, you can do the math. This is four times four. It's about a half a meter. And then you pack these together. And this is 25 kilowatt hours. It's about a cubic meter. And that's the manufacturing in Marlboro. And now you put all these together, and you get something about the size of a 10 meter shipping container. And that'll give you about two megawatt hours. And this can stand outside. It doesn't care about the temperature, because it's operating at 500 degrees C. So it doesn't matter if it's in the coldest part of China or if it's down in Hong Kong, it doesn't matter. Whereas lithium ion batteries, you know what have lithium ion batteries? Next to lithium ion batteries is a giant air conditioning system to keep them from getting hot and exploding and catching fire. So we're inventing all the power electronics too. All that has to happen. So this is silent. It's emissions free. Diesel gen sets emit a lot of pollution. No moving parts. The, the, I know the electrochemistry will last for 20, 30 years, but if the parts fail, that's no good. Remotely controlled. This can act both as a source and a load, and sometimes on the grid for frequency regulation, the remedy is not more current. The remedy is to get rid of current, and this thing you can send 1,000 milliamps per square centimeter through it, and it takes it and doesn't harm it. And it's designed to the price point of the market. So uh, I'm going to end with this battle cry from Paris, 1968. This is what I tell all of my students. Be realistic. Ask for the impossible. And you know, sometimes with enough ingenuity, 
uh, the impossible becomes the inevitable. So that's the challenge for you. Thank you. Professor Saloy? I would be happy to take questions. Yes. So the question is, is uh, about the, the degree of adoption. And the answer is it's not widely adopted. Our first deployments are going to be about a year from now. So we're still on the path. You're seeing this as it's transitioning from the lab bench to manufacturing. And I'm, I'm thank you for the question because it, it's, it's, this is very different. Energy is so different from everything else. Why? Because the scale is greater and that means the timeline is longer and the rate of investment is greater. It's the polar opposite of IT. IT, you have a brilliant idea, you get your team together, and in six months you've got a product and it's out there. And you don't have to wrestle with physical reality. It's, it's, it's all in your mind. But at the other end, you have energy. And the level of complexity and the burdens are so great. So it's a long journey. So the company was formed in 2010. We may have a product by 2015. And most investors, they won't last for five years. They say they're different. They're not. Because their money came from the same place. And the expectation of the turnaround is shorter than the time required to develop the technology. So for those of you who want to go into energy, be prepared. It's, it's a long, hard struggle. but the prize is worth it. Because everything we know today that we value, all the cool stuff, it's predicated on electricity. If you don't have electricity, you don't have anything. So you need to guarantee the security of electricity and do it in a sustainable manner. And that's something that excites me. I'm looking for the big problems. That's why I don't work on nanotech. Nano's too small for me. <laughs> what are your challenges over the next one to three years? The challenges over the next one to three years. The challenges are, well, there's twofold. First, and the, the technology challenges are all the things associated with manufacturing. The electrochemistry works. We've never had any hiccups with the electrochemistry. But now, to go from a single cell to that big battery, there's all sorts of things in uh, seals, power management system, power electronics, reliability issues, even getting just reliable things from your suppliers. We've had horror stories with suppliers where they give us some parts, they look good, and then without our knowledge, they change some minor thing. We have to go to them and teach them about quality control and so on. And so there's all those kinds of things. And then the second piece is the electricity market is so complex. You know, if you and I started an oil company today, we could explore, drill, pump, ship, refine, and sell to the public. But in electricity, the people that generate it don't transmit it. The people that transmit it don't sell it to the rate payer. The, the market, so there are all kinds of regulatory hurdles as well. And nobody wants to be the first adopter. You know, they say the early bird gets the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. The first mouse gets this. The second mouse gets the cheese. And so nobody wants to be the first adopter. They all stand back and say, let's keep in touch. <laughs> That's true.